gotta say, things went pretty well. Except for the dilapidated planet, endangered inhabitants, and the bruises. Because I have a lot of bruises. You think you have a lot of bruises? Oh, come on. You're in a metal suit. What do I have? Nothing. Andy, this metal suit is like a rib cage. When it stops, I keep going. So I'm constantly slamming into the side of this thing like a nickel in an empty can. What the din is that? That alarm is to remind us to do... it. Oh, come on! We just got home! We're injured! I think you're still bleeding into your shoes! Yes. Bleeding. You're peeing into your shoes, aren't you? Have been for days! Anyway, it's time we do... it. I hope you mean what I think you mean. James and Andy's half-year review of all the games we played in 2019 so far? We may need a shorter name for that. Well, review mo sounds weird and isn't good for SEO. Supreme Everlasting Opstoppers? It just means searchability, I think. Yet another reason I'll add to the list of reasons why acronyms are stupid. It's a long list. Grows every day. Anyway, back to this. Now that we've cleaned and stitched ourselves up, it's time to get to the games. We've played quite a few in the first half of the year. Before we begin, these are presented in no specific order and only include games that have come out between January and when this video releases that we haven't already done separate reviews for and that we felt we've played enough to form a complete opinion on. All right, let's start with... Any of you remember Burnout? That whole series of games where you crash cars, cause damage, and kill other drivers with the least amount of finesse, the most amount of carnage, and a medium amount of effort? Well, the original developers, departed from EA to form Three Fields Entertainment, are back to reignite the love we had for their car crashing game. Well, they've been back for a while with Dangerous Golf, Danger Zone, and its sequel. When they left EA, they didn't leave for very long or go very far, they're still creating games full of destruction. Their latest release, Dangerous Driving, does little more than help you realize that these guys are not what they once were. It is a game full of bugs, glitches, and awful, awful design choices. No multiplayer of any kind at launch, arrows that point you in the wrong direction, Danger Time does absolutely nothing to help you in races, races that last 10 minutes with 5 minute laps, AI that is constantly ahead of you, races that will place you in last place after one single crash, and worst of all, it's boring. If this is a spiritual successor to the Burnout series, why not include other things Burnout is known for? Perhaps these are the things that will be added to make the $30 price tag worth it, but as it stands, we're still waiting for that day. On to our next game. From the same people who brought you Bomb Chicken comes this lovely mobile game that will distract you for hours while you meticulously plan your shot. Get as many holes in one as you can in a row to rack up coins so you can afford more new skins to change the kind of ball you play with and the types of courses you encounter. Unlock an ice puck for slippery levels, a bowling ball to slow your shots down because you're golfing with a f***ing bowling ball, and more! Nitrum definitely hit a hole in one with this game. Awful pun, just terrible. I know. Ordinarily, I steer myself away from hardcore platformers like this because they aren't my cup of tea, but Almost There kept me playing until almost the very end. There were a few levels that were definitely above my skill level, but on the whole, most of these levels weren't super difficult. But it is just another action platformer that makes you play as a square with no personality, no face, and no point except to jump and wall slide across levels with laser grids and moving platforms. Oh, come on, Andy. When has a story or personality ever helped a hardcore platformer be good in any way? Hmm. Yeah, you're right. Almost There sets itself out to challenge you, and it does through more than 80 levels full of death traps and jumping hazards. Grab this fun little game and test your patience because some of these are pretty difficult. This game is very short, so this review will be too. This game is made for the speedrunner. You will beat this game in an hour or less. It features a guy with a huge sword whose girlfriend is kidnapped by an easily defeated demon. The whole game takes place in one map. Get this game if you want a short, rather unsatisfying game that could have been way bigger for the premise it has. Oh well. Next. Another extraordinarily short game, but this one is pricier. Ooh! In this game, you're meant to defeat an evil wizard type character before they can do nothing. They do nothing. They sit in their castle, wait for you to reach level six, which makes the whole game a boring grind fest, then gets defeated by you. For the hours and hours spent fighting monsters, finding the wizard's power crystal things, and fighting bosses, I was expecting it to pull out a second form on us, but it just didn't. Then it died and the game ended. But the game doesn't just end, it repeats. You defeat the wizard, but not for good. 
it returns a hundred years later and you repeat the whole game again. Same gameplay mechanics, stores, towns, locations, enemies, same everything. This game is a time loop. It is an unsatisfying game with no ending. You can spend skill points to make your next run easier, but what's the point in that? It's all an unfun time loop. Speaking of time loops, our next game is also Swords of Ditto. No, it's not. I'm picking one from the list randomly. Oh... I'd rather do the other one again. Too late, this is the one you picked. You'd think for such a quirky and adorable looking game, I'd be excited, but it's single answer, unfun puzzles make it an almost unplayable experience. Like who could have possibly figured out that you were supposed to kick a spider to make a bridge? Really? How does that make logical sense? Also, the co-op advertised in the trailer is specific to a few mini games. The trailer should definitely have advertised that instead of just saying, co-op, even if adding it wouldn't have made the game any more fun. So many missed opportunities in this game. Oh well. Super Phantom Cat is one of the many demos I got to play at one of the Penny Arcades I attended, and it was a lot of fun. It seemed like it had potential with the many unlockable characters and the simple platforming mechanics. Did it evolve much between the demo you played and its full release? No, not at all in fact! I was expecting a little more flair, a little pandering to a Super Mario Bros type build much like what Suzy Cube did, but Super Phantom Cat didn't evolve and is only a cutesy looking platformer about bipedal cats. It's not bad, but it's not good. Do you think you'll finish it? I'm not as determined to as other games because in all honesty, this one kind of puts me to sleep like Mini Ninjas does. And I take that as an insult to one of my favorite games, so we're gonna move on now. Man, this list is littered with these Devolver Digital games. I hope that means they're doing really well. With the creative games they keep putting out, it must mean that. I hope they become a beacon of hope for indie games looking to be published. Anyway, on to their next venture, Ape Out. Ordinarily for a game like this, I have an angry rant prepared because of how unfairly hard it gets and how it actively doesn't want you to play past level 6, but I'll hold off on that for now. As you progress through the game, levels will add different hazards to this top-down ape escape game that affect future levels. Alarms, lights turning out, enemies with bulletproof armor, and the list goes on. However, after the lights go out and your only light sources become the blinking warning lights, the odds are heavily stacked against you. I loved this game for the first three levels, and I tolerated it for the next three. I have no interest in beating it, and I hope those that enjoyed it continue to enjoy it. Support Devolver Digital because they're doing a great job. Next game. Were you saving your big angry rant for this game? It has turned into disappointment. For those that watch me stream this game, they are very aware of my unending frustration with this game, specifically one single level. It's also a good thing that I, that this is the venue that I use to watch, to make sure I don't waste money on games anymore, because your Switch is full of a lot yes! that I would never play. A level which the developers had to fix later so it wasn't an acidic pile of garbage that really dragged the game down. No, my anger turned into disappointment after I realized that Blaster Master Zero didn't need a sequel. Not one like this. Not one that just added useless characters, took away one of the most powerful weapons, and added in these cheap, awful challenges to pad the game. And ultimately fell very flat in the end. Every boss is the same, planets are emptier than they were in the prequel, and the challenges are awful. Ultimately, it fell very flat, a far cry from what the prequel was. So. You're saving the angry rant for later then. Uh, don't worry, it's coming. Yet another action platform from Devolver Digital. This one I had way less fun with than Ape Out and the amount of fun I wish I had with Gato Robato. The story is about a samurai contracted by a shadowy company to kill people while having the ability to uh, manipulate time. It's interesting in the beginning. What about the middle? For the end. Didn't make it that far. You see, in conversations, there are these choices for things you can say to move the game forward. Your answers will be in red text meaning don't f***ing do that until the characters you're talking to finish what they have to say. Then more answers pop up. Those answers will be in blue meaning, yeah, go ahead, pick this one. Where is this going? There is one point in this game where you have to solve a conversation puzzle to get out of a kidnapping where your kidnapper will kill you if you pick the wrong conversation choice. I will preface this by saying no matter what blue answer you pick, in any order, you die. That seems unfair. The point of the puzzle is to use the blue answers to learn as much as you can about your kidnapper before you die so when the game revives you at the beginning of the conversation, you can use your future knowledge to your advantage. Unfortunately, no matter how much you know, how much you say, and how many times you go through this with every blue answer, you die every fucking time. Seems weird that a game would train you to use this mechanic only for it to fail when you need it to avoid death. Ah. 
But you see, you are supposed to use the red answers, flipping this whole game on its head, making you wonder, would this game have gone differently had I used the red answers in conversations prior to this one? From that point, I was out. I didn't need this game. Also, the one boss battle with that guy with the axe is complete f***ing bullshit. He takes seven hits, you take one hit from anything, you die. Hate it. Never again. That's fair. We've hated games for far less, that's for sure. Alright, next we have... Come on, James. Do we really have to do this one? It's another generic battleground game with loot boxes. There. That's the review. It's not fun and continues to not be fun, just like the others. Did you really think there was anything else? We're moving on. What an unmitigated, unmanageable, messy, unimpressive, time-consuming, flawed, unfair, confused mess. This game has so many mechanics and abilities it wants to make work that it ruined all of them at once and makes an almost unplayable experience. To start, this game is unbelievably slow, paint dries faster than each mission will last, which could be anywhere between 45 minutes and 2 hours. And who has that kind of time? Next, combat is incredibly tenuous and could quickly screw you over within moments. Any of your units who are even slightly damaged will deal a reduced amount of damage, meaning units that aren't at full health might as well find a cliff to politely jump off of because they're no longer of any use to you. This mitigates any risk you'll want to take because one ship off their HP means they're essentially useless. Which brings me to my next point, the difficulty slider. The slider is a way to temper the game to your own skill set so you can progress through the game at your own pace. However, Wargroove has a different way to interpret the slider and the rewards earned from a harder or easier experience. Raising the slider from the default midpoint will earn you no extra rewards and only serves to make your go of it much harder. And you may as well not even lower the slider at all. Doing that will drastically reduce your rewards for each mission, so if you want an easier game, best play something else because Wargroove accepts nothing but the default performance or risk losing out on looking at their sweet, sweet concept art. A reward which impresses and interests me, but may not interest the general populace interested in this game, making playing through any bit of this game worthless to the average player. Maybe they updated it since launch, I don't know. I have no intention of returning. That was quite the rant, Andy. Are you okay? Yeah, but next time, split it into paragraphs on the script. That is just a wall of text. I'm good, though. Let's keep going. Unfortunately, we were unable to experience this game to its fullest extent because who really has three friends they can just sit down to play video games with at a moment's notice? No one, that's who. Mowing and Throwing is a game about garden gnomes cutting lawns. Two teams of players compete to do this, whoever cuts theirs first wins. There are items to slow the other team down that fall from the sky at an alarming rate, and they could easily mess you up too if you run into them with your mower. I imagine this is a very fun game to play with four people with two teams of two, but we were relegated to games of 1v1 which are a lot less of a party because you're to manage power-ups, mowing, getting gas for your mower, picking up rocks, avoiding mushrooms, and figuring out how the hell this tiki level works all on your own. It's a lot to handle. Another issue is the lack of AI, which would have definitely added a bit more to this game and actually allowed us to play with four players. Even if only two of them are human, let us team up and take down the computers. Get this game if you have a party of people excited to mow their lawns, or if you have three friends to sit down for some couch co-op fun. Otherwise, you're gonna be sitting there, alone, on your couch, wondering why you got this game. You're lonely, dude. Go out and meet some people, or purchase a single-player game. After 13 years, we finally see the release of the final game in this saga of the Kingdom Hearts series. There it is. Right there. Was this worth it, guys? Was it really worth it? In no way, shape, or form! This game could have been very popular in the release window we expected, you know, 13 years ago, but today? No. They missed the window, but I give them props for releasing it anyway. That's all we give this game props for. The story is atrocious, the gameplay is repetitive, unclear, and dated, and the whole experience is just... Not fun. This whole game is just one major disappointment, with plot holes a Prima Guide for this game could fit through, and a crummy, unsatisfying ending, which we won't spoil here. It's a slog, and it tries to capitalize on the hype that left us at the station years ago. It's hard to get excited about a sequel to a series that we've all just forgotten about, but we hope some of you enjoyed it. Keep enjoying it. Alright, next one. If you're looking for a game with hours of replayability, the freedom to change the difficulty to your liking, and multiple unlocks that aren't tempered to the way you slide the difficulty up or down for yourself, look no further than Remy Lore. Remy Lore is about a barely passing student who accidentally wakes up an ancient tome while cleaning her school's library and is transported to the lands of Lore. From there, she must go through each level and fight the robotic creations she discovers. While short, the first playthrough of this game will have you discover a much deeper story about the lands of Lore and the mystery surrounding this android with bunny ears that seems to be following you around in this game. After the first run of the game, which should only take you about two hours, more difficulty settings, weapons, costumes, and an extra character are all unlocked, basically telling you you can now play the game any way you want. Play it on f 
fucking hard mode where one hit gets you killed. Play it on piss easy mode where one hit gets the enemies killed. Or any of the other suggested modes you unlock. There are some unlockables that are only available for certain modes, but those are for completionists, so we're not really interested. My only true gripes with this game are the price and the length of the game. It was short to feed the idea of replayability, but I wish there was more. More levels, bigger worlds. This is a very fun game and it would have been nice to see more. The second is the price. You will lose interest in this game way before it ever actually balances the playtime with the price because $40 is a lot to pay for two hours each time you play the game. It's okay, we paid way more for worse games. Even so, this one is a lot of fun, and you can play with a friend. Crush some robots together, collect each weapon, put on some costumes, and crush that android. The lands of lore will be kind if you can act fast. Good luck. Alright. There are a lot of noises and colors and things going on on screen, and I'm not even sure James knows what's going on. He's right, I don't. The one thing I can appreciate is the art style of the illustrations for each class that are shown when you recruit characters. I, uh, I'm gonna do my best to explain this game. There is a labyrinth. You are an adventurer. You want to reach the end of the labyrinth. Wow, that was easy. Okay. Why? I honestly have no idea. The story doesn't really ever explain why you just decided to one day charge into this intense maze looking for some golden tree or something. But what I can tell you is that you go through the planet's core. So the whole game is just a pit of 100 trials that never really ends? With a boss every floor and an even harder boss every 10 floors. Every 10 floors your hub world gets upgraded with a foundry for upgrading weapons, a trade shop for trading materials and stuff, and other buildings that are absolutely useless. This doesn't sound like a game someone can get invested in. It sounds rather grim grindy and repetitive. That's because it is! It's hard to get into a story when it's barely there and hidden under a pile of repetitive enemies, maps, and bosses. At least most of the music is enjoyable, even if that is a low bar. Alright, on to our next game. Here we are guys, the final game in our pile of first half of the year games. We've sifted through the good, the bad, and avoided the ones we never even wanted to touch only to arrive here. Yoshi's Crafted World on Nintendo Switch. This is an absolutely whimsical adventure that sees Yoshi take center stage. This game is a welcome addition and will only have you smile from ear to ear throughout your first time in each level. The worlds are decorated with area appropriate trinkets that add life to each level and most of which you can hit with your eggs. Collect the happy flowers to unlock each world, then collect coins to buy boxes Yoshi can wear. These adorable additions will allow Yoshi to take extra damage from things without you losing hearts. A lot of them are great but some are just above and beyond, even if they only let you have two extra hits. That's more than zero and that's enough for me. This truly is the best platforming Yoshi adventure we've ever gotten and I sincerely hope we see this type of Yoshi game evolve further. Bosses are fun, levels may last a while but you don't notice because you're enjoying them too much. Chuck eggs, swallow enemies and work your way through this vibrant, colorful and most of all, fun game. And that will do it for <clears throat> James and Andy's half-year review of all the games we played in 2019 so far. Just call it review mo for Nehru's sake. Just something shorter than that. Well, how about Yahirochi Wuptusif? Sounds like the worst combination of letters in the number two ever. Right next to Tales of Zillia 2. It is definitely among the worst. Real question though, are any of these games we played thus far contenders for your Game of the Year award? No. Nothing could possibly measure up to the next six months of releases, with two Zeldas, Super Mario Maker 2, Luigi's Mansion 3, Animal Crossing Switch, and whatever else Nintendo announced at E3 last week. Good points there. I personally don't feel any of them deserve it yet, but we'll see. On to the next six months. Hey there, thanks for watching. I'm glad we could entertain you with our shortest reviews of every game we played this year so far. Obviously many more games released, but we either didn't have the time or patience to get to those. Maybe we will before December. Either way, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and remember to have a great day. We hope you do. See you next time.